are now tuned in to the Storm Tracker Podcast. Welcome back to the Storm Tracker Podcast. I'm Marcus Benjamin, representing for CanesCounty.com, part of the Rivals.com network. And this week, we'll have our Scouting the Opponent segment where we break down the opponent of the Miami Hurricanes. And this week we have Grayson Mann joining me from Tiger Illustrated, part of the Rivals.com network. Thanks for joining me today, Grayson. Marcus, thanks for having me on. I think it's been a, it's been, it feels like it was yesterday I had you on my podcast to talk about your hurricane. So we're coming full circle here. Yeah, absolutely. And we're already kind of midway through the season. The season's kind of flying by here. And here we are. It's Clemson week for the Hurricanes. And uh, Miami's had this game circled on its calendar uh, since it came out that they were going to play Clemson. The last time the Tigers visited Hard Rock Stadium, it was ooh, it was a bad, bad game. It, it was a, one of those games that I think all Hurricanes remember but want to forget. <laughs> a 58-0 thrashing of the Hurricanes and essentially the end of the Al Golden era here in Miami. Uh, but this this year's Clemson team, a lot of people are doubting this Clemson team uh, and, and maybe for good reason, maybe for not a good reason. Uh, this team, I think, is pretty solid at four and two. Uh, their two losses are to two highly ranked teams who will actually do battle this week in Florida State and Duke. But in your opinion, Grayson, what is right with the Clemson Tigers this year? And maybe what's not right with them? Yeah, and as you mentioned, four and two, but still a pretty solid team. As Dabo puts it, and I think he might anger a lot of the fan base when he says that this team is probably four or five plays away from being 6-0, and and it is those yeah. small plays this year, and I'll just kind of start with what hasn't been right about Clemson. It's been the routine execution for them. Whether you look at simple handoffs with Will Shippey or, or Clay, Cade Klubnik that result in costly fumbles that uh, go into touchdowns, or you look at handoffs at the one at the Duke game that result in Duke getting the ball back and not able, having Clemson be able to take a lead. So for the Clemson, it's been, can they stay consistent in that area of just no one's sweating on a third and one when Klubnik has to hurt hand it off to Will Shipley for what should be a simple first down. That's been Clemson's biggest miscue all year, and it's been really something that I don't think people have ever seen at this level is that level of inconsistency on such a simple basis, if you get what I'm saying, Marcus. And yeah. I guess what's been going right for Clemson has been their defense. I think Wes, what Wes Goodwin's been able to do this year has been phenomenal. Granted, he's got talent at every single level. He's got a really great defensive line that can fly to the quarterback, maybe keep them contained like they did with Jordan Travis, whether it's Xavier Thomas, who's really starting to come into his own, or freshmen like TJ Parker, who leads the team in tackles for losses or sacks. There's bona fide star-level play at every level, and it's kept Clemson in a lot of these games when the offense sometimes isn't holding up to their end of the bargain. Yeah, yeah, you mentioned that uh, Dabo uh, thinks that this team could be 6-0. and Cristobal also mentioned that in his uh, press conference this week, that this team is just a couple of plays away from being 6-0. and uh, But when you look at the games that they played this year, uh, which games do you think are maybe, – or which game do you think is their best performance and which game is their worst performance this year that you've seen? I think the best performance I've seen this year has to be the one we got to see in person, which was against FSU. Marcus, let me tell you, this is the most intense I've felt the atmosphere at Death Valley, probably since Lamar Jackson and Louisville came to play Deshaun Watson. You just felt like this, this game consistently, it was back and forth. There was a lot of energy. It felt like this was like a top five battle, really. And the way Clemson's offense was able to move the ball, I think, Cade Klubnik played his best game of his career. He stood in the pocket and took a lot of shots, but at the same time, he was delivering the ball out. He was moving the chains consistently. The run game started to get better as the game went on. Yeah, they had the turnover that uh, it resulted in FSU tying the ball game back up. But I think what you saw there was a team that, yeah, they had their struggles with Duke, which we now realize is a really phenomenal football team. 
But the way they're able to stick in it, the way the defense was able to contain Jordan Travis, the way Cade Klubnick was able to continue to progress as a quarterback, because like you, like we are probably going to talk about, we're going into his eighth start against Miami. And so what I was really excited about was a team that we're looking at Florida State's probably going to be a playoff contender. But I think the way Clemson will be able to stick in there, they're a play away, a play or two away, like we've said all season. But I think FSU stands out as their best performance of the year. Yeah, I agree. I I think they should have won that game. I, I think, you know, a couple of plays go their way. The Tigers come out with a victory. And, you know, we're not talking about Florida State making a playoff run. Uh, but what do you think was maybe their worst performance of the year? You know, I, I really I think a lot of people are going to think that I'm going to say Duke from the beginning of the year, but I truly think it was the Wake Forest game by a couple right before the bye. And I think this was this you get this weird feeling sometimes before games, Marcus. You're like, man, the energy just doesn't seem right. And we've t- we talked about this team with energy a lot. It's because there's a lot of players right here that are their catalyst to bring that fire back up for this team. And when you go into Wake Forest, they'd made so much progress offensively with Florida State and Syracuse. They were starting to take care of the ball better. They were starting to figure things out. Cade Klubnick was starting to really progress and move the chains. And then they just hit this wall offensively against Wake Forest. And I think for Klubnick, it was these two games against FSU and Syracuse where he was standing in the pocket, willing to make throws, willing to put his body on the line. It felt like the sheepest, sheepest nature of Duke. It felt like the team took two steps forward and then took one step back right before the bye week, which is where you're supposed to kind of enter that little break with a lot of momentum. And it felt like they didn't play their best ball as they are going to have this two games road stretch against Miami and NC state. So I was a little disappointed going away from that game. I don't think wake forest is as talented as the score says it probably says it does, but for the Clemson team, I think it was important for them to reset and get back into what they were doing with FSU and Syracuse, those two games offensively. Cause defensively, I think without that performance wake forest, we might be talking about a Clemson team that's three and three instead of four and two. Wow. Yeah, I, I definitely thought you were going to say the Duke game because, you know, just because of the, the margin uh, on the mm-hmm. scoreboard. Um, but um, we all obviously know that Duke is, is a very good team. Wake Forest, I don't think we're sure if that's a good team or not. So I could see why you went with the Demon Deacons over the Blue Devils. Uh, you did mention Cade Klubnick, so I did want to ask about him. People kind of want to know how he's developing highly touted recruit and he you know basically replaces dj ua Ungalale. so what have you seen uh from the young signal caller and do you think he's developing into the highly touted, touted prospect that he was yeah i think that he's really i think that we got to remember this is his eighth start and i don't I think a lot of fans after the uh, UNC and uh, or the UNC game in the Orange Bowl last year were really excited because they had this card all of 2022 as, man, we have this young guy in Cade Klubnik who brings in a lot of energy. I distinctly remember, Marcus, it was the Syracuse game last year. Cade comes in for DJ and he gets this first down and his arm, like I thought his arm was going to fall out of his socket the way he pushed forward it for that first down signal because he just had, he was a little ball of fire as I like to describe him. And I think that kind of translates into his game with the pocket is that he's wanting to do so much so fast. And so sometimes he may be too quick to escape. Sometimes he makes a little bit of a misread too early. But, you know, I think the thing that the positives about him, he's got unparalleled confidence. The energy is unlike anything I've seen in a Clemson quarterback in a long time. And I think when he's in his when he's in the zone, really, he's got great accuracy and touch. And he's really started to understand, Marcus, that. He can make something out of nothing. He's an athletic guy. He Against Florida State and Syracuse, there were plenty of times where he was able to roll out of the pocket, make plays to his receivers, use his legs too to extend the pocket, extend chains, move those first downs. So I think the, what I'd stick maybe with the negatives and what he has to get better is sometimes his efficiency in the red zone isn't what we'd want it to be. And I think continue to race his awareness inside the pocket because there is times he's maybe waiting too long for a receiver to get open or he's too singularly focused on a read. But overall, I really like what I see from him, and I think Clemson fans should be excited about his progression throughout 2023. And he's very mobile as well. So if you could just kind of talk about his mobility and just kind of how dangerous he is once he gets out of the pocket. 
yeah, what what I what we touched on earlier is Klubnik's starting to understand that he's he's pretty athletic, and uh, he's I think what his that next step within his game is going to be realizing, hey, I can make plays outside the pocket. I can really move around. I think there was a play against Wake Forest where he it was almost like he was making a number on the field the way he was running around, and he was able to turn maybe an eight yard loss into a first down purely on his athleticism alone. And so I think the key for Miami is getting him rolled out, getting him in areas that he's comfortable. And that fo- that bat- backyard football-esque part of his game is really extending plays on first down, maybe on third and eight, rolling out and finding receivers close to the sideline, setting up plays where he can not only throw the ball, but create damage on his with his legs. Yeah, as you were saying that, he, he made the play on this highlight here uh, against Florida State where he got out of a tackle and was able to get – looks like maybe a 13 yard gain out of it. So you definitely see the athleticism from club Nick. Uh, but how is he doing in this offense? And, you know, Dabos Sweeney made the change to a, to a Garrett Riley uh, this year. Uh, some people are happy with it. Some people are not. What's your opinion of, of Garrett Riley's offense? And do you think that's, it's the right fit for the, for the Clemson Tigers? Yeah, I think so far it's been pretty solid for Garrett. Like, I think we gave him a B, B-plus on TigerIllustrated.com. And our uh, current, we had a piece on where Clemson football stands. And we think the offense is really progressing in the right direction. But I think for me, it's sometimes that there's a little bit of an overthinking scenario where he's trying to be too smart. Where I think people will point out that third and one in overtime where uh, it was a simple, like, hey, you can just hand it off to Shipley, who was really starting to pick up steam. The running game started to really really churn up yardage in that second half and they throw a bubble screen out to the left and it results in Clemson eventually turning it over on downs. I think Riley's scheme clearly works. I think receivers are getting open. I think the run game is starting to get better as the game progresses. I know people will point the point at yards per rush against Wake Forest, but this is a team that gets better as the game progresses, especially with the run game. But like I said, with the past game, receivers are getting open. Klubnik's getting the ball out quick. I think they recognize the offensive line isn't a big strength of this team, so they have to get the ball out with quick game. they got to make sure receivers are getting open quickly in space, and I think that you're seeing that. It's just sometimes that this offense isn't able to get out of its own way with turnovers, and you have these, like we said before, simple execution handoffs, or you have just loose snaps from the center, get hitting Klubnik's left side, and then Charleston Southern, Wake Forest, whoever you want to call it, is picking it up and p- turning it over for their offense and getting points out of it. So for Clemson, it hasn't been a scheme issue. I think it's just been taking care of the football and making sure that protection aspect of their game is solid throughout the rest of the year. Now, I also wanted to ask about the offensive line because that offensive line has had some lapses uh, where they've allowed or their execution hasn't been on par and it's led to turnovers at times. So, just what you've what have you seen from this offensive line and do you think it's getting better after six games i think it's it's a mixed bag for me for the offensive line i think the group is continuing to get better but at the same time i think i still see some inconsistencies and simple protections i i think i I was sitting with my boss at the uh, charleston southern game and going is that they not getting a push off of this csu defensive line and it's just a little bit concerning and i think you can see that against better competition that sometimes they really do struggle to run the football early, which I think against better teams, it's going to really cost you. Wake Forest, they're going to be able to get about 0.8 yards per carry uh, in the first quarter. And I think against a good Miami team that can move the ball offensively, where you have to move the chains, keep Tyler Van Dyke off the field, and try to create points on the road, if you're only averaging 0.8 yards per carry against teams like that, it gets really difficult. And so I think for this offensive line, there was a quote from Marcus Tate where, they're talking about he we spoke on Monday is just that we have we just didn't have the right mindset against Wake Forest and that the guys let them have it but they responded in the second half and ran the ball much better. For me, it's about can we get that mindset that Marcus Tate mentioned? Uh, there's Clemson starting left guard. We need to see that difference in Miami at the start instead of being like, oh, we need to wake up in the third quarter and get things done. I hear you. Uh, Miami's kind of had that problem as well. Um, just starting fast, I think is going to be really key in this game, especially with Clemson coming off the bye. So um, this is kind of a wild card question. We didn't talk about this before, uh, but how is Clemson 
I don't know if you, you know, kind of seen their performance on, on a year to year basis, but coming off the bye, Miami hasn't done well. <laughs> and we, we saw that this year, we've seen this in past years, uh, but do you expect this team to come out with the energy uh, that they need to, to get a win in hard rock stadium, or is it a possibility that they come out flat here? You know, Marcus, this is what I tell my uh, friends. And I think this is the unique, one of the unique perspectives that I have is that I'm a student on campus. So I get to really hear everybody's opinion all at once. And they ask, I think I had a question about the wake forest game. And they're like, what do you think this is going to be an easy win? Right. And I go, well, if based off of everything that Clemson football has taught me in the last three years, it's to expect the unexpected. And so I think we've seen that, that product on the field, but I think for Clemson out of the bye, I think that the, it was almost a good thing that they got a little bit of a slap in the face against wake Forest because you go into this bye week going, man, we're not as good as we thought we were. We've only really won two in a row with a close loss against FSU, man. They're really starting to like, like their own stuff. And so I think for Clemson, it was a good thing that they had a little bit of a lull against probably an inferior opponent so they can go in with this with the bye week with an emphasis of starting strong. And I think Dabo and this crew is going to recognize that and hopefully get off on the right foot against Miami. But again, it's a very much we'll see thing. I can't definitively say for sure based on what I've seen this year. I hear you. Uh, well, we'll, we'll see kind of which Clemson team shows up on, <laughs> on Saturday, but uh the defense is something that has been pretty consistent. However, um, has been pretty consistent over the years. Uh, what have you seen from the defense and, and who are some of the players that are really standing out to you on that side of the football? Man, the defense has been really fun to watch this year. I think they've kept Clemson in virtually every game. And I know people point to the 28 points against Duke uh, and say, well, where, where was that defense? And I think once you turn over the ball as much as Clemson did in that game, it almost becomes the defense is out in the field the entire time, and eventually something's going to give. Um, but the couple players for me have been really the freshmen besides uh, the standout corner in Nate Wiggins, who I think is going to be a first-round draft pick uh, in this upcoming draft. But TJ Parker, man, uh, a freshman standout. A lot of people in camp, especially in our uh, coverage of Tiger Illustrated, it was very focused on Peter Woods. We were very excited about this five-star product that was coming to Clemson, and he's performed very well, but TJ Parker has been been this team's best defensive player through the first six games. He leads the team in sacks. He leads the team in TFLs at eight and a half uh, he sacks at four and a half TJ Parker's ability to get off the ball. And he's not even starting Marcus, which is a crazy thing too, is that his ability to get off the ball and create pressure and just come in and be that spark plug for the defense. Maybe there's a lull. Maybe they give up a first down or two. Number 12 will come in and create some absolute chaos. And man, he's been a treat to watch as well as Khalil Barnes on the defense He's been our stand-in for Andrew Makuba, who's faced some injuries early on in the season. But you get worried sometimes about a young freshman DB because everyone remembers that Wake Forest game last year where Clemson's secondary was completely depleted and Sam Hartman for toss for six touchdowns. Khalil will come in, and it doesn't look like the game slows down. It does not look too slow for him, and it looks like he's in a role that he can come in and much more than hold on his own. So I think this Clemson team has, at least on defense, stars on every single level. Look at guys like Xavier Thomas, TJ Parker, uh, Ruka Roro, uh, Tyler Davis. Then you look at Barrett Carter and Jeremiah Trotter as the linebacking duo. But two potentially NFL players on Sunday next year. So there's a lot of talent for Wes Goodwin to work with, and he's really made the most of it so far through six games. Awesome stuff from you, Grayson. Uh, Grayson Mann uh, joining me once again from Tiger Illustrated, part of the Rivals.com network. So – Clemson and Miami are pretty even when it comes to ACC statistics. You know, when you look at, uh, you know, they're rushing, uh, they're pretty even. Uh, Miami's third on offense when it comes to rushing. Clemson is fourth on defense. Clemson is number one in, in rushing defense. Miami is second. When, when you go to the passing statistics, Miami second. Uh, when it comes to passing, Clemson is seventh, uh, but still uh, a threat through the air nonetheless. And then on defense, um, you know, Miami is, is eighth uh, in the league while Clemson is third. Before I get your prediction on how you think this game will turn out, 
what do you think Miami, what do you think Clemson rather needs to do to get a win in hard rock stadium? I think first and foremost, it's taking care of the football, especially when you're on the road. I think there's a factor too that people don't normally talk about. It's going to be pretty hot in Miami. It's starting to cool down here in Clemson. And you know, that humidity is going to be quite an adjustment, I think to start out. But, um, I think for Clemson, it's got to be taking care of the football. There's got to be the routine execution that we've talked about beforehand that, hey, we got to come in here, and as long as they are within the turnover margin or not getting blasted by it, they have a pretty strong chance based on the level of talent that they have on this roster. But I think it's that, and I think also it really comes down to can they run the ball effectively and tire out this Hurricane defense and extend long drives. We saw that against FSU where they were able to put the ball together and methodically drive down the field and keep a guy – like Jordan Travis, one of the ACC's, if not college football's top quarterbacks, got to keep him off the field. You got to also keep Tyler Van Dyke off the field. I know people aren't talking about him as much, but he's thrown for 16 touchdowns. He's thrown, I think he's completed over 70% of his passes, if I'm correct, Marcus, but he's also been a really efficient quarterback. So we got to keep him off the field as well. So at Clemson, I think it's running the ball effectively and taking care of the football to be able to try to keep this Miami team in check. Yeah, same for me for the Hurricanes. I, I think turnovers has been a real issue for for this team. Um, if you saw the highlights of the North Carolina game, that was kind of what did them in in that one. Uh, they had three uh, critical turnovers in that one, um, including one right at the goal line. So I, I think if Miami can, like you said, <laughs> with Clemson, take care of the football, then – you know, it, it may go their way. And I think the other thing for Miami is that they have to cause turnovers. You know, I, I think I think uh, this team needs to definitely cause more turnovers for them to win these type of games. It, it's not going to be just, you know, causing punts uh, that will allow the Hurricanes to win this one. Um, I, I think they definitely have to turn Clemson over in order to, to win this game. Now, when it comes to this game, Clemson is a road favorite. Uh, they're favored by three and a half. Last I checked, uh, Grayson, I uh, hate to put you on the spot here, but, you know, um, how do you think this game turns out when it's all said and done? And by the way, I checked the weather. It, it's going to – right now, it's, it's kind of cool for us. It's kind of maybe frigid for us South Floridians. Um, it's it, We're actually in the 60s in the morning and, and maybe low 70s at night. It's not the usual 80 humidity uh, type of type of weather. And, you know, if, I guess fortunately for, for both teams, it, it's going to be at night, so it's not going to be as humid if it was during the day. I mean, it's going to be in the 80s, you know, by noon. Um, but this one's a primetime matchup once again for the, for the Hurricanes. But when it's all said and done and it's the final whistle, how do you think this game turns out on the scoreboard? Man, this is a this is a really tough one because I think both these teams are so similar. Like we've been able to point out is that some that you see moments of brilliance that are overshadowed of moments that, man, they just can't get out of their own way. They're right. so close. So I think for this team, I think it's going to really come down. I think it's going to be a defensive battle, Marcus. Um, I know a lot of people might see Cade Klubnik and Tyler Van Dyke and just think of those two individually and go, okay, this is going to be a high-scoring game. It's two electric quarterbacks that are continuing to get better. I could see this being a 38-35 game, but I actually think the opposite. I think both teams are going to really emphasize the things that we've talked about this weekend is running the talk, – talk about today is running the football well and effectively and taking care of the football. So I could see – I think when it comes down to it, I trust Clemson's defense just a little bit more. I think they're going to be able to create some pressure on Tyler Van Dyke. So I think when it comes down to it, I think Clemson's going to start to really, I think Clemson's, what they're going to take into what they're able to do in the second half against Wake Forest, which was run the football better and really drain out this clock and try to get out of that kind of slugfest. I just trust Clemson a little more in that situation. So I'm going to take Clemson 24 to 17 in this one, Marcus. But at the same time, it's like, man, what Clemson team is going to show up? in Miami on Saturday night. Yeah, that that's a really, really good score there. I, I am, you know, a loss for words on, on how this <laughs> is going to turn out myself. Uh, you kind of never know with the Hurricanes or which team is going to show up. Miami's playing with a chip on their, on their shoulder, though. I mean, two 
heart wrenching losses here. And this, this is a team that had very high hopes coming into the season. So I know they're somewhat deflated emotionally, but I think this team is going to rally uh, in this type of game. And what, what you see in college football too, is that, uh, expect the unexpected. I mean, because, you know, like it's college football. Uh, and I think home teams, uh, especially home dogs really usually show up big time. And it, it, it really kind of depends if Miami starts out fast here, if they can jump out to a lead, I think Miami has the advantage because I think they can kind of pin their ears back um, and put a spy on on Klubnik in case he runs, um, you know, decides to run and really, you know, cause some disruption with with their offensive line. Because, I, you know, I asked you the question about the offensive line, because I just I just think that at times it, it, it they just look a little suspect, you know, at times. Um, but I think um, if Miami can control the run, because uh, I don't think they'll be able to stop the run. Um because Clemson's one of the best at doing that. If they can control the run. And I mean, when I say control, I mean, not give up 50 yard runs, <laughs> you know, don't give up 30 to 50 yard runs, you know, which we saw last week with Marion Hampton at North Carolina. I think they have a chance. Um, I'm not exactly sure if they'll win, but for now, who knows, maybe my prediction will change when I put out my prediction story uh, later in the week. But I, I'm going to take your same score, but I'm going to say Miami. <laughs> I'm going to, yeah, I, I'm going to say it's going to be a 20, uh, let's say 27, 24. And Miami finds a way uh, to, to win this game uh, with, with a late turnover. I, I, I think um, the, they, they can get pressure on Klubnik similar to the same way Florida State did late in that game, uh, causing that turnover, then I think Miami wins. But we'll see what, what I think at the end of the week. Uh, I don't know. I, I'll just have to break this game down a little bit more to really, really um, solidify my prediction at the end of the week. Yeah, I think it's, it's, uh, it's going to be an interesting one regardless because I think both of these teams could be seen as – I, I, I don't know who coins it, but it's wounded animal mode. Both teams have their back against the wall, especially with an ACC play. Both teams really need to get a conference win to really feel good about themselves heading into this back half of the season to have a chance to compete with the Dukes and the FSUs and the UNCs to try to sneak into Charlotte in December. Yeah, I, I think one thing's for sure, Grayson, that the loser of this game is completely eliminated from that possibility of making it to the ACC championship game. I, I seriously doubt with three ACC losses that they would have a chance, either team would have a chance to make it to Charlotte. Yeah, something that's crazy have to happen. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Grayson Man, ladies and gentlemen, he was kind enough to join me this week for a segment scouting the opponent. Thank you for joining me and hopefully we'll see you soon. Are, are you coming down to Miami for the game? I, I am not actually, I'll be watching it from uh, my apartment at home. So, okay. uh, but uh, I'll be there. I'll be probably joining in on zoom for those post game press conferences. So I'll be there in spirit. <laughs> Absolutely. And hopefully we'll, we'll get to connect again soon, uh, maybe for basketball season. Actually, I haven't even checked the schedule if they if they play Clemson or not. But uh, um, hopefully we'll connect again soon on another edition of the Storm Tracker podcast. Make sure you subscribe to the to canescounty.com for free. Use the promo code Miami30. Make sure you subscribe to this podcast as well. The Storm Tracker podcast on all platforms. Also subscribe to this YouTube channel live from Canes County. Until the next episode.